Today's message is about legacy. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Bible is a book of legacy. The Bible is a book of succession. The Bible is a book that changes lives. And if you read the stories and you know the stories, you will find yourself in at least one, if not more, of those stories in God's word. But Abraham was a man of faith. He had three tests. He had to leave. He had to believe God for provision when he was to sacrifice his son Isaac. And then he was to receive the grace of God when he tried to take matters in his own hands. Three tests of faith. His son Isaac ruled and reigned, and then Isaac led to Jacob and Jacob had 12 sons and we know Jacob became Israel he wrestled with God and got his hip knocked out of joint how many of you can identify with that you're serving God now but your your testimony wasn't roses and candles you lost the wrestling match and that's why you're serving God now that's kind of like my story I fought as long as I could and just kept losing I said Lord we're going to do this thing your way Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He had 12 sons, if you know that story. He had two wives, Leah and Rachel. Rachel was the love of his life, and he favored his two sons, Joseph and Benjamin, that came from the one he loved. So much to learn about this ancient story, but I want to focus in today on the provision factor, the father's provision Every good and godly father is a father that provides. When you can't afford it, a father will cover you. If you can't understand what to do, the father will provide wisdom for you. He will provide strength for you. He will provide resources for you. He will provide a pathway for you to follow. And one of my favorite stories in The book of Genesis from chapter 37 all the way to 50 is the story of Joseph. He was favored by his father. He was given the coat of many colors. His brothers were jealous of his ability to dream. They were jealous of his anointing. They were jealous of the father's favor on his life. And you must understand when you ask God for favor, you need to be ready for the consequences that come with favor. Because favor isn't fair. Favor can't be understood by the natural man. So if you ask God for favor, understand that favor brings haters. And what is a hater? Having anger towards everyone receiving success. If you accomplish something, you will have haters. If you are favored by your Abba Father, you will have haters because people have orphan spirits, they have daddy issues, and they hate you for what they feel like was taken from them at an early age. It's not even about you, it's about what's missing in them. And so I will go through the story today, but he goes from being sold into slavery to the Ishmaelites, and if you know the history, Isaac and Ishmael, isn't it interesting that the enemy always repeats negative history? And he's sold to the Ishmaelites. He ends up rising to leadership under Potiphar. And then he's accused of having an affair with Potiphar's wife, although he was a man of righteousness and did not have the affair. She wanted him sexually. He said no, but because she was so angry that he rejected her, she falsely accused him and he was put into prison. And wouldn't you know that even after they put him in prison, he still had God's favor and the father's provision while he was in prison and he interpreted dreams and he was promoted in prison. And then eventually to the head of state, Pharaoh's right hand. There are 101 parallels between Joseph and Jesus Christ. I don't have time to go through each and every one of them, but if you look at the story of Joseph, you will see a picture of Jesus Christ rejected by his own, ascended to the right hand of the Father. There are parallels in this story, but the story is powerful because of the way it ends. Father Jacob believes his son 
has been dead for 22 years. There's a famine in the land and they go to Egypt, the brothers, to get food because they're starving to death. And when they get there, they realize after some conversation that the person that they're asking for wealth and resources from is the brother that they sold into slavery. And there's where the ancient text reads what the devil meant for bad. God meant for good. Powerful story. He forgives them. He's reunited with his only maternal brother, Benjamin. Jacob nearly has a heart attack when he finds out he's alive. He sends all kinds of wealth and resources back to the land and calls for his father. And this is what the text says in Genesis 45, verse 21 today through 28. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey. Everybody say provisions. He gave to all of them, to each man, the ones that sold him into slavery, by the way, changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. And he sent to his father these things, 10 donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. So he sent his brothers away and they departed and he said to them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. It's interesting, the last three weeks that word troubled keeps coming up. Whenever God wants to do a new thing, whenever God is providing for his children, there's always an enemy that wants to trouble the spirits of the father's children. And we must make sure not to be troubled in spirit. Even Jesus said in John, let your heart not be troubled troubled he says so they'll not become troubled along the way then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father and they told him saying Joseph is still alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt and Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them imagine thinking your child was dead 22 years and yet you receive word from your other children that the child you thought you lost was alive. And it goes on to say, but when they told him all the words, what moved Jacob to believe the brothers? Words and wealth. It says, when they told him all the words, because see, no one sounds like your son but your son. No one sounds like your child but your child. You know that voice. And if you have a daddy, you know that voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So there's a familiarity with the voice, with words. You know whether the words came from someone that you're connected to or someone that you're disconnected from. The words and the wealth, and it goes on to say, but when he saw the carts and the resources and the wealth Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, the father revived. There's something about a resurrection spirit that brings revival to the soul. There's something about a resurrection that brings us back to life. There's something about overcoming the odds that brings the underdog in us back to life back to reality. There's something about when people have written you off, when people have spoken curses and doom and gloom over you, there's something about when you survive that and then you get to a, the pinnacle and you are still standing there. I don't know about you, but I just want to take a selfie sometimes and send it back to the people who said I couldn't get where God had called me to get to. Every now and then, you need to remind the haters that in spite of their nonsense, you still chase God. In spite of the slavery they tried to sell you into, you found your freedom. I'm telling you, when you are walking with God and under his favor, nothing can stop you. Nothing can hinder you but you. And I'm telling you, when we shift our focus to Abba, things change. Then Jacob, Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is alive. I'm going to see him before I die. 
The dynamics of any relationship will change with time. I owe God a great deal of gratitude to still have my parents here. That's not lost on me. My best friends from childhood either didn't have fathers or lost their fathers at a very young age. And I've always been grateful to have had both parents and to still have them in good health. I thank God every day for that. But over time, our relationship has changed. The Lord has allowed me to live long enough to see them get to a place where I get to provide for them and serve them. Over time, a relationship will change. First 25 years of my life, my parents took care of me. And now I get to help take care of them. And it's a blessing. But in every relationship, eventually the provider becomes the recipient. The nurturer becomes the nurtured. The covering becomes the covered. The dependable becomes the dependent. Can I get an amen? amen. And parents, and I'm speaking to myself, if we pour into the, our children and we speak legacy, then that is the way it's supposed to work. And you see a picture of that in the patriarchs we've mentioned today. You see the son becoming the provider for the father. You see Joseph stepping in to care not only for the ones who sold him and shamed him, but you see the role of the father switch to the son. The revelation of the father fulfilled in the son as he provides and cares for his family. Abraham is a picture of God the father. Isaac is a picture of God the son. Why? Because he was to be sacrificed and Jehovah Jireh entered into the scriptures and into the atmosphere and a substitutionary sacrifice took the place of Isaac. Jacob, the one that wrestled with God, the one that went back to Bethel, the one that God renamed to Israel is a picture of the Holy Spirit giving birth to a new nation. Joseph is the fullness of all of those characteristics put together and he is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, with these patriarchs, we see some key doctrines of the faith. The first one, Abraham, you see the doctrine of election. What is the doctrine of election? God calls and favors certain people for his sovereign purpose. You see, some people don't like that, but it's the truth. Jesus has favorites. He had 12, but he was closest with three. He has a people that he says, these people are the apple of my eye. He loves us all. He died for us all. But the doctrine of election says, listen, even though Abraham may not have been worthy, God called him to be the father of a nation. Isaac is the doctrine of justification. I've taught you this through the book of Galatians on Wednesday nights. The word justification is just as if I have never sinned. You see, man wants to hold our sin over us. Man doesn't forget what we did or what we used to be. But because of the blood of Jesus, we've been found not guilty. You don't have to live under guilt or shame or condemnation from religion or anybody else. You've been set free, and who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Romans chapter 3 teaches us about the doctrine of justification. God erases your sin and the guilt associated with your sin. You see, we all understand we've been forgiven of our sins. Everybody, I hope. If you, if you do, wave your hand. The quicker you wave, the quicker I'll preach. <laughs> we all understand we've been forgiven. If we know Jesus, we know the Bible. But most of us don't live in the reality that we've been forgiven of the guilt associated with our sins. See, when David committed adultery in the Bible and he was crying out to God in Psalms, he said, Lord, you haven't just forgiven me of my sin, you've forgiven me of the guilt of my sin. Because it's the guilt that'll kill you. It's the guilt that'll keep you in bed. It's the guilt that'll depress you. It's the guilt that 
if you give it freedom, it will defeat you. The doctrine of justification. Then we have Jacob, Israel. This is the doctrine of sanctification. God conforms us to his image whether we want to be conformed or not. Even if he has to knock our hip out of joint. God will make sure those that he called and predestined will get to where they're supposed to get to. And then Joseph, this is the doctrine of glorification. This simply means resurrection. This is the promise of resurrection. My son was dead, but now he's alive. Not only is he alive, just like Jesus, he's promoted to the right hand of Pharaoh, but in this case of Jesus, to the right hand of Abba Father. That is the story of God's word. So we, we see all of the unfair treatment that Joseph went through. Can I ask you a question? Did he deserve to be sold into slavery? Did he deserve to go to prison? See, we live in a culture now where everybody's a victim. And some of you aren't victims. You haven't been through enough to even be considered a victim. Imagine going to prison for something you didn't do. Imagine poverty. Imagine getting beat up and abused and lied about. Imagine 22 years of it, not two minutes. We go through something two minutes, we think we're a victim. We identify with the crowns and the lashes because we went through a bad day. No, I'm talking Joseph had every reason to be a victim and to claim victimhood, but he didn't. He continued to walk out his dreams. He continued to do what God had called him to do. He didn't let the prison stop him. He didn't let Potiphar's wife stop him. He didn't let his brothers stop him. And there has to be a resurrection in your soul that won't quit, that won't back down, that'll stand up straight when you're attacked. We need more of it in this day and age. We need more of it. We need people who will stand for the truth and stand for the word of God. I'll tell you, one of my favorite people is Dr. Robert Jeffries. You may not like him. You may think he's too mean, but I love him. He's preached here. He texts me all the time. I texted him yesterday about some things going on with the Baptist denomination, and I told him my dad went to hear him preach in Alabama. Dr. Jeffrey said, I love you and your dad so much. He said, Ronnie, don't worry about all that stuff in the Baptist. Keep doing exactly what you are doing. That's what he told me. But I love Dr. Jeffries because he's just a little old skinny guy. Probably couldn't whoop a fly. But man, when he gets asked on national television about the gospel, he's not ashamed to call sin sin he's not ashamed to call evil evil and that little skinny guy will stand up and he will proclaim the word of God and he doesn't care what anybody thinks of it he doesn't care if they boycott him cancel him we need more of that in this day and age hated by his brothers sold into slavery falsely accused and in prison forgotten in prison interpreted dreams of a cupbearer and a baker and interpreted them correctly and got promoted in the prison. Listen, I don't care if it's a baker, a butler, or a candlestick maker. Nothing can stop you from the favor of God if your focus is on him. Like our own Lord, Joseph is rejected by his own. Jacob is informed that Joseph is dead. Long forgotten, he ascends to the kingdom. Listen, they may have written you off. They may have said you're a good for nothing. Nobody never will be. But if you'll put your eyes on Abba Father, he'll make all of your dreams come true. And he will give you the ability to dream your own dreams. See, some of you are trying to live out somebody else's dream. It's time you got a dream of your own. Do you know that God will give you a dream of your own? Three of you. You know that God will give you a dream of his own? He'll do it. Joseph's provision, powerful. He didn't just forgive his brothers, he blessed them. I don't even like preaching this because it convicts me. You know, we say, I've forgiven them. Yeah, but you still don't talk to them. Yeah, but you're still talking about them. Yeah, your blood pressure goes up when the name gets mentioned. Your heart palpitations start when you think about them. 
Uh, he didn't just forgive them, he blessed them. He restored them fully. Just like Jesus did for us. Rejected by his own. Beaten, slandered, never did anything to anybody. But he went through all of that for you and me. There's some principles that had to be walked out by Joseph. The first was the, is the spirit of rejection. The spirit of rejection. Everybody say what it says in parentheses. He faced it. Ready? One, two, three. He faced it. How do you deal with the spirit of rejection? You face it head on. Some tables you were never meant to sit at. Some tables you were never meant to sit at. You were rejected because you were trying to be included in a group that God never wanted you to be a part of. You were rejected because the people that you wanted to accept you weren't the right people for you. So if you ever walk through a period of rejection, you face it head on. You chalk it up to being God's sovereign will and you keep moving. You might have been rejected but trust that God had a plan that was better than the people that rejected you. He faced it. That's what it says of Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 11. It says, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. It hurts worse when you love the people that have rejected you. The spirit of rejection. I see this in churches all over the world and in this church. We talk about orphan spirit. We talk about heaviness, depression. Much of it stems from a spirit of rejection. I have been rejected in my past. I let it define me for a number of years. And I'm telling you this because I've been through it. Let it go. Forgive them and move on with your life. There is a land of Canaan waiting on you, a land flowing with milk and honey. There is a blessing on the other side of your rejection. There are better relationships. There's a better church. There's a better ministry on the other side of your pain. Don't allow them, whoever them is to you in your story, don't allow them to keep you from the favor of Abba. Spirit of rejection, number two, the spirit of revelation. Say this with me. He embraced it. Yeah. Yeah. The spirit of revelation, Joseph embraced it. He embraced the ability, the gift God had given him to dream. He spent many years as a slave and an inmate in Egyptian prisons, yet God had not forgotten him. We get letters from inmates all the time, about four a week, because we've sent books. I've sent my books. Dad sent his books for free for many years. He recently got a letter from Arkansas. I got one from Virginia two weeks ago and another one from Georgia. We served the prisons. I baptized 30-something people years ago in a prison. We have Kairos that flows out of here. We have Miss Jones serving Silverdale. We've got a lot of different people involved in prison ministry. Don't ever judge the people behind those bars. Some of them didn't do it, first of all. Second of all, even if they did do it, Hebrew says to remember those who were in chains. Some of you were just inches away from being there yourself. The spirit of rejection, the spirit of revelation. Chapter 45 of Genesis. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out for me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. Let me continue, verse 4. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved nor angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Basically, I had a purpose, and God allowed this to happen so I could fulfill my purpose. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. 
And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So he's so far past his pain that he can't even deal with it. He's focused on his purpose. See, some of you have embraced pain to the degree you can't find a purpose. Don't be defined by it. He goes on to say in verse 9, Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son, Yosef, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, you and your children and your children's children. Everybody say legacy. Your flocks and your herds and all that you have, there I will provide for you. See, the dynamic of the relationship has shifted. I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. And he says, tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here, he kisses his brother and he kissed all of his brothers, wept over them. The revelation he embraced. You see, Jesus was rejected and it says in Philippians, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Can I get an amen? Taken on the form of a slave, a bond servant coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name. See, nothing can stop you, not a cross, not a grave, not slavery, not a false accusation if you're under the covering of Abba Father. Number three, the spirit of resurrection. More on this next week the spirit of resurrection. In speaking of death, he defeated it. Everybody say, he defeated it. The spirit of resurrection. Although Joseph wasn't literally resurrected as Jesus was, it was a picture of the resurrection to come. It's a picture of your resurrection. See, the devil thought you were dead. The devil thought you were done. The devil thought you'd never make it, but here you are. Does that resonate with anybody? The devil signed your death certificate, but here you are. You are here. And Jesus ripped it up. And I'm telling you, as long as you're here, you've got purpose, and that purpose is to bring God the glory. I'm somewhat of a boxing fan. Always have been. Always pulled for different kinds of fighters growing up. Everybody pulled for Mike Tyson that was my age, but I always liked Holyfield. I always pulled for him. I like Butterbean, the big fat guy. I mean, come on. I, I, I like the underdogs, but obviously Muhammad Ali is considered the greatest boxer in the history of the sport. And he had a daughter named Layla Ali, and he didn't want his daughter to box. He because of his Muslim beliefs and other things, he just didn't think it was a sport that a woman should be involved in. And he was against it. In fact, he didn't support her in her first five or six fights. And then eventually he came. She was really good. And he started crying and said he was wrong. Layla Ali, her boxing career was 24-0. She was women's champion toughest fight she ever had was against a lady named Valerie Manfood or Mafood and Valerie was getting the best of Layla Ali she'd gotten hit a few times she'd stumbled and she had a few rounds left she got her composure and she came out and she beat Valerie it was a powerful victory and the person interviewing Layla Ali at the end of that match said how did you come back from that beating how did you how did you win that fight, Layla? Like you were getting creamed. Whew. And I felt this, and maybe you'll feel it too from John 14, but she said, she said, you know, she said, I remember when my father 
was getting beat by George Foreman and Joe Frazier. I remember my father got put in jail for what he believed in. And she said, I was able to come back in this fight today because I saw my father come back from so much. Somebody, I'm telling you, I sometimes feel like that in ministry. People say, how do you deal with the nonsense and the demonic attacks? How, how do you not quit? Because I saw my dad fight it and not quit. I saw my dad fight back. I saw my dad stick to it. But more than that, we have a father in heaven. And Jesus was the revelation of him. So when you feel like quitting, think of Abba, Father, and think of the revelation of Abba, which is Jesus Christ. Think of the crown of thorns. Think of the rejection. Think of Golgotha, the place of the skull. Think of the shame. Think of how we disappoint him every day, but he still loves us. And when they ask you, why are you still doing this? Say, because I saw my daddy send his son to die for me, to have purpose, and to persevere. There's a spirit of resurrection that will quicken your mortal bodies, that will give you fight when you don't feel like fighting, that will give you purpose when you've lost it, that will give you redemption when you've blown it. There is a spirit on the inside of you if you're saved. And then there's a spirit of revival, number four. Everybody say, he reigns over it. And then they told him, saying, Joseph is alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still. Stood still. The one they thought was dead is not just alive, but he reigns forevermore. He's a person of promise and prosperity. He can provide for those he loves. He's in charge of a whole nation. The person that the devil thought was dead got up out of the grave in three days and he reigns over a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Kingdom that we have access to by way of the Holy Spirit. Oh, there's a spirit of revival where our souls will be revived, our bodies will be revived, our purpose will be revived. Nothing can stop us and no weapon formed against us can prosper. Amen? Number five, the spirit of redemption is found in this wonderful story of Joseph. Everybody say, he paid for it. You know, he paid for your purpose. He paid for your forgiveness. He paid for your pain. He paid for your resurrection. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Aren't you thankful that we've been reconciled, reconnected to the Father through Jesus Christ? Sin separated us, but Jesus brought us back together. Genesis 45, verse 27, verse 28. Joseph, my son, is still alive, and I will go and see him before I die. Can you imagine the scene? When Israel, Jacob, the one who'd wrestled with God and went back to Bethel, when he, as an old man, rode that chariot into the capital of Egypt, after all those years thinking his son was dead, can you see him embracing his daddy, saying, Dad, you don't ever have to work again. I'm paying for it all. You don't ever have to miss me again. I'll walk with you and I'll talk with you. You don't have to worry about the famine because you're with me now. That's what Jesus did for us. He said, brothers and sisters, you don't have to worry about your shame. You don't have to fear dying. You don't have to live under guilt and condemnation anymore. Why, Jesus? Because you're with me now. And I give you the spirit of revival. I give you the spirit of resurrection. I give you the spirit to dream again and to persevere through unfair circumstances. You don't ever have to worry again. Fear not, brothers and sisters. I've come that you may have life and have it to the abundance. He didn't just say, Dad, I'm just going to 
put you in a little old room somewhere where nobody will ever come visit you. He says, I'm going to give you everything that I have and more. And that's what Jesus has done for all of us this Father's Day. He came on behalf of the Father to offer us a life filled with purpose and grace and redemption and power and spiritual motivation. All we have to do is say yes to it. Somebody shout yes. yes. Hallelujah. Give God a shout of praise today. Would you bow your head with me this morning? I'm going to have my pastors make their way to the front. Listen, maybe you've been through some unfair circumstances in your life. Maybe you've been through some difficulties. Maybe you've shamed your own family. Maybe you're not a victim. Maybe you victimized people or victimized your family with your own decisions. Whatever it may be, if you're living under guilt this morning, I invite you to embrace Abba Father through Jesus Christ. Maybe you need spiritual healing today. It's still very early compared to normal. I wouldn't leave here today without allowing the Spirit to heal my soul, to fill me up. But first, if you don't know the new covenant, Joseph, his name is Jesus. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How do I get to heaven? How do I embrace my purpose? How do I dream again? How can I live outside of guilt and pain? Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, my friend, and you'll be saved. And you will be in the likeness of Jesus, which means if he's been promoted to the right hand of the Father, you have been too. So if you need Jesus in your life, I'm going to ask everybody to bow your head. If you need Jesus, just pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord, please come into my heart and save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, you say, Pastor Ronnie, I prayed it and I meant it. I, I'm ready to go to heaven. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Would you just look up at me if you prayed that prayer and you meant it? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I got hands raising too, hallelujah. All right, here's what the Bible says. This isn't the book of Ronnie. This is what the Bible says. If you don't confess him in front of your friends, he'll not confess you in front of the Father. That's why we do this. We're not going to parade you up on stage, tell your story. But if you looked at me, and many of you did, some raised your hands. The Bible says don't be ashamed. So when we stand, I want you to step out in faith, come down and say, I prayed to receive Christ today with Pastor Ronnie. All we want to do is get you some information, help you get started. That's the first thing. Second thing, if you know the Lord, but yet you've lost your ability to dream and you need a fresh touch from the Spirit, I know every person up here today, every one of them is prophetic. Listen, every person up here walks in the Spirit. They're all prophetic. They can speak into your life and that word will shift things. So if you need a shift, come receive it today. Would you stand on your feet? The church is open today. If you want to meet me at next steps later to join, you can, or you can join down here with one of these pastors. You do what God tells you to do. But if you prayed with me, many of you did, you come down. Heavenly Father, thank you for being my Father, for loving me when I don't deserve it, for giving us purpose, for this grace place you've built, the Father's house. Lord, we give you praise today. Lord, move in spirit and truth during this invitation time. We bind Satan. Satan, you're a liar, murderer, and a thief. We bind you from the minds and the souls of people today, and we speak peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God some praise for this one that's already came down here to say he made a decision for Christ. There are others. You come. Don't miss your moment as we worship.